welcome to the Institute for the Study of Muslim <laughs> Civilizations. Uh, my name is Gianluca Parolini and I'm the faculty lead uh, on the uh, governance <coughs> program, which, is, which has organized and is hosting the event tonight. Uh, tonight's event is part of the Dialogues <coughs> 2017 Dialogues series. Um, you should have a postcard uh, with uh, the entire series of the uh, events <coughs> of the year. Um, the dialogue series this year is experimenting with a different format, more dialogical. So I'll spend just a couple of words about that um, so that you know what will um, happen. Uh, firstly, let me underline that we would like to make <coughs> this as informal as possible. So I will briefly introduce the topic of tonight, uh, and then I give the floor to um, the um, guests. Um, in 10 or 15 minutes, they will probably uh, offer some preliminary comments. Then I will give the opportunity to each of them to react to the other's uh, um, comments. And then we will open the floor to the general um, uh, <coughs> discussion. The entire event will last one and a half hours. Now, the speakers tonight will help us read the Russian draft constitution for Syria. Uh, in light of regional governance. Uh, in this sense, a constitution can be simply defined as a governance arrangement uh, to regulate decision making. Now, constitution making thus generally uh, marks the end of a period of conflict with a post conflict settlement that guarantees the return of politics from the battleground to state institutions. Is this the case? Can a constitution be written before conflict ends? Can it help ending a conflict? What does Libya teach us? The Russian draft was <coughs> released at the Astana Peace Conference, Peace Talks, uh, held uh, earlier this year in January, at the end of January. But it had been announced since mid-2016. Some read it as a welcome sign of the impending end of the conflict. In the past two weeks, of course, uh, we've witnessed the rekindling of that conflict. I mean, if we think of uh, Khan uh, Sheikh Noon or um, the, 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 the people that were moved from uh, Foa and uh, uh, and then the their buses were bombed uh, when they were leaving Aleppo. I mean, th and the conflict that is now rekindling also in Dara, I mean, are all signs in somehow a different uh, direction. Um, so just a very brief background. The constitution that is currently uh, enforced, enforced a tricky word here, is the original 1973 text that was uh, introduced during uh, Bashar al-Assad's father's time, uh, in 2012, after the beginning of uh, the um, uprising, um, there has been a referendum on amendments to the text. Now, the two main areas in which amendments touch the text were on making Syria a multi-party system and um, uh, limiting the terms that uh, the president can have to two, two, two seven-year terms. So in this context comes uh, the Russian draft, which uh, I say it looks like very American. Uh, why does it look very American? Well, firstly, it has uh, it offers a bicameral system in which there's an upper house that looks a lot like a senate. Uh, it doesn't speak, of course, of a federal structure, but it speaks of administrative units. Um, there's a two-term limit to the president uh, with possibility of impeachment in the upper house. Again, you know, this sounds very familiar to uh, U.S. constitutional law. There's a constitutional court, which we know has been the must of uh, um, uh, expertise, American expertise in constitution making overseas for the past uh, three decades, at least. Uh, there's a robust Bill of Rights. 
Um, and, uh, well, this is the non-American part of it. There's the cabinet is responsible or is accountable to the lower house, so which makes it a semi-presidential um, system. So the question would be, so why has the opposition rejected it at the uh, peace talks in um, uh, Astana? So this is somehow just, you know, the background. Um, um, there is online, there is a text, so there's a, of, of course a problem with the text. So what is the text? So there's an original, original, good knows, uh, a text in Russian um, that was translated into Arabic uh, and then the, that text was circulated in Astana. <coughs> Um, both texts are, are, are available online, and there's also two English translations, one that is less accurate than the <coughs> other, so if you'd like to refer to one of these <coughs> translations, I would suggest you to go to the memory, M-E-M-R-I, website rather than the other, because it's a, it's a far more accurate um, um, translation. All right, so I've taken too much time. Our guests tonight, uh, we have a guest that comes from very close, from the uh, um, floor above us, uh, the um, uh, Leif Stenberg, uh, the, who will take the floor first, uh, according to the agreement with the other speaker. And um, among the many publications, I will just mention one that is very uh, um, um, relevant for tonight's topic, Syria from Reform to Revolt. It was actually in a friend and colleague's office, so to show how uh, uh, this book is uh, relevant. And he's, of course, uh, besides being director of uh, the institute, has just joined the institute as professor of Islamic studies. Um, our guest from afar, but very close to the institute, a very good friend of the institute, is Jan Michel Otto from the University of Leiden. He's the author, among many other things, of Searching, Searching for Justice in post gaddafi Libya. And in Leiden, he is professor of law and governance, and he <coughs> directs the Van Vollenhoven Institute. So also our interest in having them interact and uh, discuss this issue is that they're both having two institutions that are engaged with issues of governance from a European capital, but then that looks at um, uh, Muslim context like our program uh, is interested in. So without further ado, and again, based on the agreement uh, with the speakers, I will first give the floor to Leif Steinberg. Thanks, Jan Luca. I, um, I have actually written a paper. Uh, I'm going a little bit against the idea of the idea, open and dialogue and the, 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 the more perhaps relaxed version. But I felt like being a new director, I would like to be prepared doing this. And so I actually prepared a short paper. So be, bear with me. Um, in the following, I will take an ethnographic perspective founded on partly my professor, profession. I'm a professor in Islamic studies and partly on experience from fieldwork in Syria. Uh, my research in Syria has been focused on one religious movement in, in Damascus. So uh, to understand and <coughs> analyze this movement, I have adopted a perspective in which I consider it significant to understand religion and the religious movement as part of society and not separated from it. One aim has been to think about the role and function of religion in everyday life. Uh, or in order to illuminate some recent experiences and to link this perspective to governance and the Russian draft uh, for the Syrian constitution, I begin with two excerpts from interviews with Syrian religious leaders carried out in Beirut in early January 2017. Uh, for a while I've been interviewing Syrian religious leaders in Beirut. They travel from Damascus and we meet in a hotel in downtown Beirut. Some of them I've known for almost 20 years, and we used to start the meetings by catching up on recent developments in Damascus and in Syria. One of my friends is an old gentleman, old gentleman, born in the 1930s, and today approaching the age of 80. He stated that in conversations with his friends, many of them are psychologically fatigued, and they almost refrain from commenting on either their personal situation nor the war in the country. 
conversation of an end, my friend stated, uh, by saying phrases like Alhamdulillah. In this context, uh, comments reflecting their shattered view on life in general, and conceivably a statement saying that only an abstract God may know what is going to happen to Syria or in Syria. Another religious leader participating in the meeting in Beirut stated that before March 2011, he had been a proponent of parties founded on religious values, and he had viewed the composition of a party representing true Islam as the key in making Syria a prosperous country. His idea had been that the correct Islamic interpretation, molded through a political party, would create ethical guidelines building a successful society. However, in January 2017, he had changed his mind entirely. Due to his experience of the war, religion in any form should be as far from politics as possible. And he viewed his earlier ideas about an Islamic party as immature. In my mind, these two stories are examples of views not always heard. And they point at two difficulties in relation to the creation of a new constitution in Syria. The first story represents the almost depressive stance taken towards the war in Syria. The feeling of hopelessness that runs deep and increases for every day the crisis continues. <coughs> A hopelessness linked to the feeling of Syrians and Syrians as abandoned and or desolated. If this is a representation of the general mood of Syrians, it is hard to see to what extent suggestions about a new constitution from any foreign actor will be positively received. Hence, one point I would like to make is that if, as stated in the draft of the constitution, it is going to be adopted by a nationwide referendum, then Syrians should be involved in the drafting to anchor the new constitution among Syrians, independently if they are in the state of Syria or not. In addition, it is important to gain confidence in political processes among the Syrian population. A referendum about a constitution will not be of any substantial value if why this referendum is taking place is not understood by a large portion of the people. The experiences of free and fair elections in Syria is limited. The second story perhaps reveals a position taken by religious leaders that are not linked to the Syrian regime or to Islamist movements uh, like the Islamic State, Jabhat al-Fat al-Sham, former Jabhat al-Nusra, and Ahrar al-Sham. I'm referring to the religious leaders that was prominent individuals in the Syrian society before 2011 in <coughs> villages, urban neighborhoods, and in media. Religious leaders that have performed a balancing act between the people and the regime. In a Sunni case, they were often linked to global and local Sufi networks, to economic interests, and to political ambitions. Still, the secular character of the Russian draft constitution is perhaps the first, uh, uh, is perhaps first understood <coughs> as if it would undermine the role of religion and religious leaders in society. But at the same time, if there are religious leaders already in favor of a separation between religion and politics, they may understand this form of writing to work in their favor. Also note that the draft constitution does not mention, like the Syrian constitution of 2012, Islamic jurispr jurisprudence as a major <coughs> source of legislation. To abolish Islamic jurisp jurisprudence from the legal framework of Syria <coughs> may be a difficult task, but I'm not sure that all religious leaders would be against it. My friend mentioned above would probably state that in a contemporary context it would be more beneficial to think of Islamic jurisprudence as a provider of ethical guidelines in everyday life of the, uh, to the modern Muslim rather than being an explicit source for the legal system. Both stories represent Syrian voices beyond the regime and the Islamist movements and the voice of many who are not in Syria anymore. Among some, a tiredness of the role of religion in Syria, Syria in the Syrian war exists, and there is a general feeling of despair regarding what is considered a non-existent support for Syrian Syrians in the conflict. Among religious leaders, not on the side of Islamist movements or the Christian militia for that matter, nor subject to the regime, the text of the draft constitution could become an opportunity structure, especially if the draft constitution also implies an abolishment of the Ministry of Religion slash Arkov. In Syria before 2011, citizens and people living in Syria without full citizens' rights, such as Palestinians, were not equal to the law or in the labor market, or in the society in general. 
Scholars from Syria have pointed out how the regime negotiates with various ethnic or re religious groups, especially minority groups. The primary goal is to create loyal groups of citizens who may receive benefits due to their support of the state. Hence, depending on ethnicity or religious belonging, you are evaluated as a citizen, and on the group level, you are subject to negotiation. And the result of the mediation will, will, will give your community a certain status. Perhaps this is an Ottoman rest, but the different possibilities for careers within the state for Kurds, Palestinians, Alawis, Sunnis, and Shias are founded on an, on, on an ethnic or religious belonging. Appointments to the most, to most positions, especially higher ones in the state administration, <coughs> always have an ethno-religious component. Such a practice concerning appointments is not, an, is not in agreement with the text of the draft constitution concerning individual rights and the role of civil servants. But at the same time, it is a practice that has characterized the Syrian society for long. Moreover, it is to be noted in this context that in Syria, the question of majority and minority is a security issue. The question of majority and minority also become, becomes of interest in a situation in which the question is not only about political power, but also about access to power and to, for example, the earlier mentioned labor market. In general, the policies of the regime are to create a state of distrust among the various groups in the society and to negotiate with them to ensure that they, the state, become the sole provider of safety as well as opportunities. Notably, the protests in March 2011 were directed towards the abuse of power from state officials, the non-accountability of civil servants and the widely spread corruption. And two of the most prominent slogans in 2011 and 2012 uh, demonstrations were the right to dignity and the right to freedom. In this context, the problem was the regime, the authoritarian Syrian state. That was the reason for the uprising in 2011, a state primarily concerned with security issues and not to develop functional state institutions. Conceivably, Syria, and what I have stated earlier, uh, is an example of a state that developed a policy of distrust and connected to this is a crack, or, or to this is cracks, or cracks in the social contract. The term social contract is here simply understood as an agreement giving legitimacy <coughs> to the role of the state and the individual in a society. I presume that in the eyes of most Syrians, the authoritarian and hierarchical Syrian state and its institutions lacks trust, especially about fulfilling a number of rights that is inscribed in the current constitution as well as in the draft constitution. There is a classical deficit in confidence. Citizens do not trust that the state will fulfill its responsibilities. If the earlier mentioned idea is correct, that Syrian is an, Syria is an example of a state that has created and monitored distrust between groups of Syrians, this is linked to the deficit in belief about the capacities of, of state institutions. And if this assumption is correct, the correct social contract has a hierarchical as well as horizontal dimension. In relation to the draft constitution, it is, in my opinion, a huge shift between the description of the social contract in the draft constitution <coughs> and the everyday realities of Syrians before March 2011, not to talk about the situation after March 11. However, support for the idea to have more <coughs> Syrians involved in the making of a draft constitution can also be part of a healing process in the Syrian society. The ongoing war has changed the demographic map, the social relations, the political life, the economic realities, and the religious landscape in Syria. Yet, when peace finally comes, the vacuum it will create regarding the role of religion, religious communities, and leaders is unclear. Certainly, this space can be filled with new understandings of religion <coughs> and or Islam. To speculate about the outcome is difficult. But two interlinked points by many questions that need to be addressed concerns the youth. Firstly, 50% of the Syrian population before March 11 was under the age of 25. In 2017, the role of youth is rarely or ever heard in discussions on current Syria. But the voices of the young need to be part of the negotiation as well as reconstruction of the country after peace is achieved. Secondly, if the assumption is correct that young Syrians turn away from religion, 
and to perform religious practices since they think religion in whatever conceptualization is the reason for the conflict. Then a well-defined constitution developed from a secular perspective can receive a considerable support. Perhaps the major challenge on this point is to organize a participation or a participation of young Syrians in the drafting of the constitution and in the peace process in general. Finally, in the broader perspective, the discussions in Syria resembles discussions on constitutions in many African and Asian countries, not least in the Middle East. Syria's most recent referendum about the constitution was in 2012, and Egypt have had about 10 referendums about the content of the constitution since 1971. On many occasions, for example, representatives of NGOs have expressed their hope that the new constitution will be the tool that put their respective country back on track. The constitution as a document that would heal social frustration, resolve gender relations, and close gaps between the government and the citizen, and hence establish a healthy social contract between the citizen and the state. I don't see a reason for optimism on any point at this moment. But one thing that is clear from the Syrian conflict, March 2011, is that it has changed and, unexpected, changed and taken unexpectedly roads, roads that were not anticipated, and it will change again. Thank you. I'll turn it right on to you. <laughs> thanks, Gianluca. Uh, thanks for your introduction. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have great appreciation for the work of the Institute. So it's wonderful to meet uh, your new director and listen to his first-hand experiences on Syria. Um, I know very little about Syria, and as we agreed, I will speak a bit more about Libya, which is quite a contrasting case. Um, my background is, I, I'm not a, a pure Middle East scholar. Um, I, I did my PhD in Egypt, and uh, my wife and I, she's an anthropologist, we lived in a small village, and I, I learned Arabic from scratch, and I can speak it, I could understand. Especially, especially if it has a good Saidi accent, <laughs> and uh, but I'm, I'm not a, not so specialized in the Middle East. My Arabic is actually quite limited. Uh, it has maybe to do something with the fact that in in our university, uh, the whole tradition of studying Islam originates from another part of the world, uh, <laughs> namely Indonesia. So when we want to uh, study the the relation between Islam and the state and Islam and law and governance, we actually have to learn Bahasa Indonesia. So, and most of what we did was um, uh, studying these issues uh, uh, through, uh, through Indonesian sources. Over time, having been uh, in Indonesia and in Egypt, and my institute works in, in other non-Muslim countries as well, gives a, a, a fairly uh, comparative perspective uh, I'm afraid also uh, sometimes a bit superficial, but I, uh, let me just uh, start with saying that in 2011, the situation as it was depicted by life, having a, a, a very strong authoritarian government where distrust among the, the, the population was, was the rule. People were just very afraid of the government. <coughs> and it was seen as highly unlikely that a, a revolution would ever be able to topple Gaddafi. And still it happened. <coughs> uh, I should say that before 2011, especially in Libya, there had already been some signs of, of reform. You all are familiar with the name of, of Saif al-Islam, the son who since 2000, especially after 9-11, after uh, when Libya wanted to show itself as being more moderate than before, and, uh, and an ally of, of, of the West in a way in the fight against terror. Um, uh, so Gaddafi had started with some reforms, um, from reform to revolt. Mm. Uh, yes, there was a revolt in Libya and it was successful. And I'd like to stress that it was 
mainly authentic. It was Libyans who did the fighting mostly. It was homegrown. It was, you may remember, it started with in, the, in the northern courthouse in Benghazi. It also had some characteristics of the East uh, revolting against centralist authoritarian rule in the West in Tripoli. There's about 1,000 kilometers between Benghazi and, 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 and Tripoli. It's, 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 you know, it's far apart. Both were once administered by Ottomans in a separate, a separate uh, entities. And it's only after the Second World War that Libya was made a state. And there was a lot of uh, United Nations pressure and intervention and diplomacy needed to create a state of Tripolitania and Cyrenaica in the east, which is the, the in Benghazi in the east, and then the south, the Fadan, which was actually French. So there was some <coughs> artificiality in, in, in the making of that state. But the revolution was successful, the tyrant was removed, and I, I, I should stress that until today that is a major achievement. And already in 2011, a constitutional declaration was promulgated by the Libyans, uh, as far as I know, also homegrown, which set out a roadmap as to how, in a couple of months and years, Libya would move from an authoritarian state to a democracy, and with all the uh, all the notions that, that that are also mentioned in this constitution and in any rule of law discussion about you know what a what a, uh, a rule of law state should look like. Um, Part of the roadmap was that there would, should be elections, and in 2012 there were elections. And perhaps you you still remember the surprise of the enormous success of these elections. Not only the fact that they were held again according to uh, uh, to election laws drafted by <coughs> Libyans. Uh, first, by the way, they began with uh, municipal elections in Misrata and Benghazi, and when those went successful then the national uh, uh, election law was made. And so <coughs> a combination of party lists and independent members led to, a, to, a, to successful elections. Um, um, the initial traditional council then <coughs> was replaced by a general national congress, more of a, a kind of a serious parliament, and the congress then appointed a, a government. And the government uh, which was already, I think, kind of the third executive after the revolution, was led by someone called Ali Zidan. And again, Ali Zidan, who was appointed in late 2012, was by all standards, uh, let's say by all international standards and by most Libyan standards, someone who practiced good governance. In 2012 and 2013, one could see the beginnings of good governance. But there was a problem of security and violence. And that cannot be solved by any constitution, by any roadmap, by any elected House of Representatives. There were simply these militias who, uh, and maybe in the discussion we can more speak about why, but you have armed groups. You have more than 18 million arms and they are divided, and at some point you get into a situation that these armed groups don't want to give up their arms. They have power, they control villages, uh, neighborhoods, businesses, and the state, uh, for different reasons, is not really able to control them. They tried to enlist them, and they did in many ways. They issued laws, they set deadlines, <laughs> They offered incentives, but in the end, the armed groups did not disarm, and there are still about about 100,000 people, militiamen, and they're controlling today parts of Libya. And Ali Zidan and his government, in the end, uh, were had to leave because some of the major militias conspired with some elements in the parliament. And so one day, a militia would come and just occupy the Ministry of Justice. One night, Ali Zidane himself was kidnapped. He was, hold, he was held hostage for a night. It was, it was a, 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 an intimidation, uh, a terrible intimidation. But from then on, it was clear that the power of the gun 
was actually ruling whatever constitution, whatever policy paper, whatever <coughs> political agreement uh, there was on paper. So that's a, that's a tragic thing. Uh, the elected uh, GNC more and more sided with some of the militias. Uh, Zidane had to leave. Then militias from Misrata invaded Tripoli. Um, to cut things short, uh, there were elections, a House of Representatives was elected according to a new roadmap which was drafted by some ac legal experts together with some par members of parliament to actually save, to save Libya. The elections were held, but many militias came from Misrata to Tripoli. The elected uh, House of Representatives had to flee the capital and go to the east where they appointed a government then the remainder of the old GNC announced that it was still in power. They also appointed a government. So you had two governments, and in practice, armed militias would still rule. And as if that was not yet enough, IS uh, came, uh, Daesh uh, came, and they occupied CERT, among other places, and CERT or CERT, or whatever is the, the correct pronunciation was of course the old uh, town of Gaddafi and people living there were very unhappy with the revolution. Uh, they had lost their face, they had lost their power and that was one of the reasons why local leaders were not so unhappy to receive uh, foreign fighters and establish a, a, a new power base there. Um, Meanwhile, speaking about constitutions, some one interesting uh, uh, element, one uh, one interesting element of the roadmap had been that a constitutional drafting assembly uh, would have to be elected and draft a constitution. And actually, in uh, spring 2014, amidst all these problems with the prime minister who had to to leave and and, 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 and deadlocks in politics. Indeed, a constitutional drafting uh, <coughs> assembly was elected by the people. Same formula as in 1951, 20 members of the South, 20 of the West, and 20 of the East. And they decided to work in more or less isolation, far away from the, from the crowd, far away from politics, and to try to be a kind of a unique, almost island of peace and discussion and deliberation. They, they have come quite far. They had their problems. Uh, they had, of course, their discussions about presidential or parliamentary in between. The role of Sharia was a very important one. Uh, the position of minorities was a very important one. The Amazigh, the Tabu, the Tuareg wanted a, a, a very a strong position in the new Libya. Um, so there were all kinds of problems. But gradually, over time, they, there have been a number of drafts. And actually, um, this week, a con so-called consensus committee seems to have established uh, agreement on the constitutional text. The interesting thing is that um, this process started in the spring 2014, and now we are three years um, from that beginning. I think it's very wise that, that this Constitution Drafting Assembly took time. Um, Tunisia has shown, has, has shown that these difficult processes take time. Indonesia, by the way, also an, an example of a, of a, of an, of a successful post-conflict uh, constitution after the fall of Suharto, they took four years. They did not uh, enact a new constitution, they amended, but they amended it drastically. And because it was so drastic and because an authoritarian state had to be turned into a democratic, human rights uh, uh, compliant state, it had to take a lot of time. Uh, and I think that that's, a, that <coughs> that's an important element. Um, still, there are major problems. Still, Libya is divided the Constitutional Drafting Assembly has not been able to heal the rift between, on the one hand, General Haftar, who is in the East, and who is now step by step controlling the whole East, stabilizing it. He promised to do it in within a, a, a few weeks, 
and then it were a few months, so not everybody believed him. But today it seems that many in Magazi are happy that life, commercial life, education, health can finally, you know, restart again. He, he's there and it remains to be seen how his position will develop. It's also interesting, maybe as by way of comparison with, with Syria, that immediately after the revolution, it was all <coughs> about were you pro or anti Gaddafi? Obviously, there was a euphoria of the revolutionaries, and they were so happy that Gaddafi had gone. But I in a few years' time, it was clear that not all problems had been solved by you know, the fact that we had now a, a, a democracy, we had an elected parliament. No, there were still many problems. And so gradually the view of whether one was pro or anti Gaddafi, that, that became less crucial. Mm. And at the moment that has also, I think, eased reconciliation efforts that are possible now that could not have been possible at all in 2012, 2013. Um, there is a there's a crucial uh, uh, discussion about who actually has is, is the com uh, general commander of the army. Hafter wants to do it, and um, <coughs> the United Nations has intervened and stimulated reconciliation uh, <coughs> to end the bifurcation, and that has led by the end of 2015 to the so-called political agreement. So whereas the constitutional drafting was a domestic Libyan affair, the political agreement was something the international community was heavily involved in. It's a, it's a huge document, it's very detailed, uh, it creates new institutions, the so-called Presidency Council, which first was to consist of three people, then of nine people, now they're nine people. They have a, a general uh, 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 cabinet <coughs> government of, of national accord, which needs to be approved by the House of Representatives, which is still the elected House of Representatives, which is in the East. That House, in fact, is basically controlled by Hafter, who does not want the House to sign uh, and to agree with the, uh, with the presid Presidency Council. So that's the conflict at the moment between the West and the East. Islam religion has been used by various uh, parties in various ways. And it's odd to see that initially much of the revolution came from the East, from people who would be, s who would be uh, framed by Gaddafi as Islamic terrorists. And yes, many of them had been trained in Afghanistan. And many were associated with, uh, with uh, radical militant groups. Now Haftar, <laughs> who is a former general of Gaddafi, is in the East and he's fighting Islamists. What he means by Islamists is a very broad specter, very broad. At the moment it's mainly Misrata, which is a very strong and important third town, uh, the um, Muslim Brotherhood, the related party, uh, so-called Justice and Construction Party, is quite strong in Misrata. Uh, in Benghazi there's a lot of suspicion against Misrata, Mr. Atai played an, an important role in the revolution. Maybe we have time to speak about that in the discussion. Uh, so, Haftar tries to frame all his opponents as Islamists. Um, there's a mufti. There was a newly appointed mufti, you know, a religious uh, leader as head of Dar al-Iftah in Tripoli, which is Mr. Ghariani. We thought initially that Islam could be the, 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 the main unifier in, in Libya because Libya was very divided about <coughs> the cities, tribes, pro anti Gaddafi, and for many other reasons. There were lots of divisions, east and west, and south. But Ghariani has become uh, the opposite of a unifier. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a hot headed. Um, rather extremist guy and he gets a lot of support from Qatar. Well, th that's, um, uh, that's, a, that's a problem. I think his TV station operates from Qatar. Um, Ms. Rata gets a lot of support from Turkey. Um, Algeria plays a role uh, through uh, Mr. Belhaj, who is a very powerful 
um, person who commands lots of militias and businesses. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the regional powers play an important role. <coughs> the political agreement has been signed by all of them. They all agree they want a stable and democratic Libya. But in practice, until today, the, 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 the foreign powers do not play a very uh, constructive and harmonious role. So, uh, to, 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 to end this, um, it's clear that what all successive governments in Libya has expressed as their priorities, it's all the same. It's five things. Uh, security, unity, uh, a state which is capable to deliver, democracy, and justice. And it sounds simple, but these five are all interrelated, and problems in one create problems in the other. And some, of course, use, for example, justice is being used by militias to say we will not uh, give up our arms <coughs> before uh, some people of the Gaddafi regime are brought to justice. But this does not happen for, for, uh, for other reasons. Um, so then why is there a governance failure in Libya? Most people see it as a governance failure. There are six, six or seven uh, uh, um, reasons, and I would like to stop there and, and perhaps begin a discussion about any comparison, if it makes sense. So first, so would, yeah. would this already be the comments on later uh, um, comments, or? Yeah, Okay. I think so. All right. Yeah. Because I think we need to move to that okay. part. Okay. So uh, the legislature in Libya which was first called uh, the Traditional Council and then the General National Congress and then the House of Representatives, <coughs> has a self-image that it's not only a parliament, but it's actually government. The head of these congresses consider themselves as heads of state. Mm. And they have a grip on the government. They uh, appoint government, they have to approve every minister, and their uh, practice has has originated in which they reject, um, refuse all the time. So here you have a weak government and a strong but divided and not very helpful elected parliament. Today, it's a, that has become a nightmare for, Libya, for Libyans. They are so disappointed. They thought that democracy would be, would be there. Democracy needs political parties. They don't trust political parties anymore. They don't trust the members of the of the, of the subsequent uh, parliaments anymore. So when there are debates about <coughs> a strong, a strong leader or a strong executive or a strong parliament, this system or that system, at least it's something one one could consider. Then the armed groups. Many people deplore that in the beginning, immediately after the revolution they were not able to, to deal with this problem of the armed groups. Had they done it then, perhaps the problem had been less now. Now it has, it, it has spilled out of control. It, it's, it's very hard to see how, how, to, how to get them back. Meanwhile, because of the insecure situation, Ross injustices have been left unaddressed. It's just the police and the prosecution just cannot go around and arrest people because arresting people is what the militias do and they're strong enough. Tribe, city, region, <coughs> and religious affiliation are put first by politicians, by militias, and they're framing their op opponents always as enemies. So there's not a political culture of, <coughs> we, we, we have together, we have to sit together, we have to make this law work, or, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, even in the, in the staffing of, of, of ministries, there must be three director generals, one from the south, one from the east, one from the west, um, to control each other. So these kind of problems with, with, uh, with state building and with creating a, a public administration. So yes, um, uh, there is a, a constitutional drafting assembly. It plays a positive role. Uh, it's not imposed. Uh, by anyone, they've been very, very, very clear about, like the, the Syrian opposition, that this is not something which needs uh, outside interference. 
they want to do it themselves and they can surely do it <coughs> themselves. Um, and then, uh, Gianluca, do you want us to, to say something about the about the uh, the Russian draft? Yeah, I think I would now give the floor to Leif first, uh, if he wants to respond to your comments, and then if you want to respond to his, and then okay. open the floor okay. because of in the interest yeah. of time. Okay. How do you feel about that? Uh, I think he has his mic, so you actually can keep this. Okay. But. Um, I took a more of an ethnographic perspective and I thought I would like to say something that has to, to co toward of the concern of the people I study and how they relate and think about this and I think there is a generality in what they are saying too and I also think that these people that I refer to are uh, a kind of silent if not majority or they represent a number of Syrians <laughs> but looking upon the Libyan case uh, Gaddafi is dead there are uh, I mean the international court you mentioned that one you mentioned the, the, bill, the constitution when you look upon that I mean and, and, and authentically many many people who have commented upon the uh, Arab Springs uh, usually comment that there, there are different springs in different countries don't make the comparison between them there are different histories and so forth but can, can, do you think there is anything in the uh, Libyan case that is really comparable to the Syrian case? N not that we can learn, but more comparable. I think you cannot compare Gaddafi and Assad and the destinies. I think there are two completely different uh, things going on. Yeah. As an example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I also, I also, prefer to to uh, to study uh, these issues as issues taking place in in the first place uh, within a particular country mm. and even within the country uh, there are so many different contexts mm. and, and, and regions and areas and I think I one of the problems of, of international interventions and of institutions like the UN or the EU is that they that they still have in mind something like best practices and that there is some kind of uh, uh, you know a kind of a constitution mm. which you can have in your computer and you travel to countries and you just change the name of the country um, <laughs> but, but then I would pro go ahead yeah. <coughs> what I also think is lacking in the discussion concerning Syria uh, is also this situation on the ground in Syria if you look upon all available statistical data you can get them, but I don't know how much you can trust it at the moment. But what you can see, if you turn to the UN home pages, is that more than half of the population of Syria from March 11 is now uh, in refugees. Uh, around 7 million of them inside Syria. Which means that 50% of the Syrian children do not go to school at the moment, or of those who are inside Syria. Four out of five live in under the poverty limit. Uh, so the situation has become so, I mean, so, so, um, so problematic in Syria. So when I, when I see these peace negotiations going on, I think it's so distanced from the reality of Syrian lives. But I don't think I see it ex the same thing when it comes to, to Libya. Uh, yeah, like you, you were more optimistic. Well, yeah. uh, well for one thing, uh, there is the oil. And it, 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 it's crazy, but, you know, unless, unless there's some armed group occupies the oil, the oil keeps flowing, and the money comes to the central bank. And even though we're all supposed to read in the newspapers that the East and West have two governments and so on, the money from the central bank still goes to pay salaries of civil service in the East. And there are ways, there are personal friendships, there are contacts, there are relations. It, so... I mean, Libya suffers from the oil curse or the diabetes <coughs> as, as it was one, one, once uh, called. If, if you travel in that country, you see that a lot of, of actual uh, you know, work, <coughs> uh, uh, manual work is being done by Bangladeshi, by, by Chinese. There are a lot of Tunisians working in Libya. So the Libyans are, are used to, to receive uh, a salary. Gaddafi had a socialist uh, government, uh, there was a lot of public uh, uh, institutions, 
And Zidane tried to control that and he found out that at some point one person, I think, received about a hundred different salaries <laughs> for a hundred positions that he had on paper. <laughs> so Zidane did not make friends when he tried to reduce this <laughs> kind of... Uh, <laughs> So that, that, that's a difference, mm. that there is, because of this oil, there is a, okay, uh, that, that there is a, a, a constant money flow and, 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 and financial support, although there is, uh, there is an end to it. Uh, yeah. Secondly, the revolution was a success, and new people have come to responsible positions, uh, deans of faculties, uh, uh, ministers, uh, there has been a, a, a mm. major change. So in spite of all the problems, people have seen that the change is possible. Mm. I think that's also, uh, uh, that's also uh, quite, quite a difference. Mm. So I actually have a slight provocation, but I will keep yeah. it for later so that actually we can open up. So I would, um, yeah, so we already have two. I'm very intrigued by the title of the topic of today's uh, talks and especially the word Russian. So uh, I look for answers in various directions. I wonder uh, which direction the August speakers would pursue. Are we speaking about a contribution to propose a future mechanism by Moscow? Is it oversight? Mm -hmm. Is it authorship of how power would be shared in future Syria? Do we see Russia's role as guarantor or it is mere stewardship filling up the gaps by the UN or by United States and EU or seeking a more lasting role in the Middle East which would change the geostrategic dynamics in the region. Is it for filling the vacuum which has been created or is it to exploit the gaps because of for example what was named as leading from behind if there is something like that. So uh, finally is it proactiveness of Moscow or inactiveness of Washington and Brussels. So how the word Russian comes to when it comes to decide the future of Syria. Thank you. Uh, can you just say your name for the for I'm Rajiv Abbas from the Institute of Smiley Studies. Uh, just for the, for the speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Mohamed Tishalji. I'm basically a lawyer and a specialist on mediation. Uh, two, three things uh, I would like to put to both the speakers. Number one, uh, there was no mention of the Egyptian contribution in Abdul Razak Sanghuri in the constitutional culture that was created during the decolonization period, during which the notion of the Sharia was at least adhered to. Number one. Number two, uh, in 2010 or 2011, I'm not sure, the Iraqi population had a referendum and they said Iraq is a Muslim state, Muslim country, whichever way they put it. And the whole issue that you cannot have a constitution without having Islam there, uh, you know, very deeply embedded in the identity of Muslims in that part of the world, or in many parts of the world. So the question I'd like to pose is that it's rather sad that 50 years after Sanuri, we do not have outstanding constitutional lawyers in a Muslim background that could play an indigenous role with Western constitutional thinkers, number one. Number two, the role of Sharia is up for grabs in the sense that the word Sharia becomes very radioactive. And I think that by keeping Sharia out, would we ever get any sort of an accord? Or might constitutional gays say what type of Sharia would be compatible with what type of con constitution do we require today in post-conflict situations. And the last point I'd make, uh, I was born in South Africa myself and was very fascinated by the, uh, the processes that took place there under Nelson Mandela. 
But today in South Africa, uh, the Constitutional Court is not being able to work because if the president tells the court what to do, what not to do, the institutions of the rule of law have to be from also the, within the culture of the country. Uh, they cannot be imposed from outside. So to what extent can local institutions be revitalized to play the new role of law institutions that are required in those countries today? Sorry, I may have been a little long-winded, but yeah, I swear. Yeah. So we're going to take uh, the first four that I um, listed, and then I'll give the floor to the speakers. Thank you for the both talks. Actually, I would like to ask a question. How do you think this kind of failure of constitution in major Arab countries is a kind of consequences of the failure of post-colonial state and the failure of notion of citizenship and equality before laws for all, I mean, for all citizens. Also the question of minorities, ethnicity, I mean, di diversity ethnic, uh, or sectarian divisions in these countries. Does it make that the Lebanese example <coughs> as an inevitable conclusion, right. as we saw the Iraqi one followed the suit of the Lebanese one. So do you think that probably the Syrian one or the Libyan one would go that direction? Mohammed, Mohammed, your name. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Mohammed Baghdad from the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilization. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm Sami Zubayd of Berkeley College. Um, I'd like to ask, you know, how relevant is the Constitution mm. in any of these countries, really? Uh, I mean, there are written constitutions in lots of, one of the most advanced, of <coughs> course, is Egypt, which has already been mentioned. But under Sad from the time of Sadat, from the 1980 on, the constitution of Egypt has been bypassed through uh, emergency, emergency laws and military courts. <coughs> and that is in a country in which there, is a, there was some degree uh, of uh, judicial independence, um, autonomy, uh, no longer the case now, of course, but it was at, at some point. Now, when you come to somewhere like Iraq, Iraq has been mentioned. I mean, you know, you had a long, drawn-out process of constitution writing and wrangling and a referendum, referenda on the constitution. Well, how? Does the Constitution rule in Iraq now? Uh, you know, and the realities of power are such that you know it's constantly bypassed by all parties. It makes me think that the Russian uh, pro proposal of a Constitution for Syria is merely a strategy for concluding the conflict in favor of Assad. So even if Assad if the Constitution was accepted and uh, written down, is it going to be implemented? Is that, who's can I, can going I, to have the power? provoking on this? So if that is used to end the conflict, yeah. isn't, doesn't that it make oh, it no, no, that's very relevant? Good. Absolutely. No, no, abs I hope it works. Uh, uh, I hope it works to end uh, the conflict. Yeah. But I mean, but the con that, that, that is a strategy. The Constitution itself, will it be yeah. of any efficacy yeah. would it be actually mm. Mm. is is really the question yeah. um and the case of libya of course is very different as you all said but mm. i won't say anything. yeah so um do you guys want to respond to this first four thank you so who did that mm -hmm. yeah i know but uh, oh. okay <coughs> um i i respond to the ones i i had time to note and uh, that i think i can respond to uh, I'm uh, Scandinavian, Swedish by, by nationality, so Russia is not my favorite country. I've never been for 500 years. Uh, but, but, uh, so maybe I'm biased on this one. Anyhow, uh, I mean, I think it's important to see the, also the old relation between Russia and uh, the Soviet Union and Syria, and also the claim the new state of Russia did uh, after they, they were established in order to... Um, to um, not let Syria escape uh, the, uh, the <coughs> borrowings they made uh, from Soviet Union, so they wanted their money back simply. So they kept uh, 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 th that relation going. They've been the provider of weapons for the Syrian army for uh, the last 30 to 40 years, so there is a strong economic relationship. 
they have the uh, uh, what do you say the, f the fleet, the base in Tartus. That's also the only base they have in the Mediterranean with access to uh, Atlantic. Uh, they also uh, are disappointed with the classical explanations, the disappointment with the Libyan experience, uh, and also <coughs> the, the competition on an international level between uh, Putin and former U.S. president. Uh, uh, and I, a, a, another point there is, of course, that uh, th there are m many layers depending on where you look upon the conflict. So I think it's very important to understand what has been going on since March 2011 as a very shifting conflict. And therefore, I think it's also important to understand that it will shift again. But in this case, it's been pointed out other things that makes R Russia stay on uh, is, is, uh, is the, I mean, as you mentioned, the influence in Middle East in general. Uh, uh, but also then that, that Syria is now a, a market, a market play for selling Syrian weapons. Uh, there are also the statement by Putin that uh, if we can kill the most, many of the, Russia, the Islamists that are from the, the former Soviet states in Syria, it's much better to have them on the uh, doing uh, attacks in, in the streets of, of Moscow. That's a paraphrasing one of his statements about this. So there are, I mean, a number of issues that I think are, are, are important here. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, post-colonial issue and the role of uh, religion. Um, I'm I'm on the view. I mean, theoretically, that religion is something produced in a sense, and therefore, uh, when we look upon these conflicts, uh, there is, a, I mean, the typical example of of uh, Lebanon. It's very clear to me that uh, religion might not be the reason for a conflict, and I, do, I think it's very difficult historically to see religion as a, as as a reason for a conflict. But due to conflict's developments, it becomes the legitimate reason for, for instance, safety, belonging, and how uh, 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 an instrument to motivate and justify why you are, 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 are in a conflict. Uh, if I say that, that's this, that uh, rules under the same principle that the uh, conflict is going to change. Therefore, I also think that the role of religion will change. And it might come out that Syria will be a very interesting case in the future when it comes to how do we apply or how do a state relate to to uh, to religion therefore i see uh, sami this as an interesting example because it's so secular in its character it's um, taking away the paragraph uh, or article three and it's uh, usually in the middle eastern context article two and three who, who relates to the role of islam in 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 in, in the society or in the state um, and in this case that that's a, an abolished uh, article so uh, even if the Syrian opposition, or rather the Syrian opposition that was represented by uh, represented Syrians in Astana says no to this very clearly, it is a draft that has been discussed and we are sitting here and discussing it uh, right now. Another point is that yes, constitutions may be of no value uh, f for many good reasons, but at the same time there are a lot of expectations uh, in Constitutions, and I'm, I'm now the uh, second advisor of a PhD interviewing NGOs, uh, female NGOs in Cairo, and these female NGOs they pay a lot of emphasis on. As soon as we can get the right uh, constitution in place, this will actually solve many of the problems in the country. And if that's right or wrong, that's a completely different question. And I'm just pointing that there is a, an, an, an expectation, and I think all these elections concerning the text of the Korean Constitution goes back to your question, because I think it's part <coughs> of, a, of a soul-searching mission. What, what is the soul and what is the identity of Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, and so on and so forth? So that's, that's paralleling the writing of the Constitution, that identity search that goes on still. So therefore, I think there is a, there is a, it is, it's, a, it's possible to refer to uh, the post-colonial uh, discussion in order to understand what's going on. That's ah, one last thing. I also think in the case of Russia uh, and Iran, uh, Hezbollah and their intervention in Syria, as it has become of now, peace is more expensive uh, than war. So therefore, this kind of low, uh, intense war fits the Syrians uh, and mm -hmm. Iranians and the Hezbollah quite neatly at the moment. If not, someone has to take a consequence for the peace. Yeah, the, the first and the last question both dealt with the role of Russia in the Middle East. Um, 
Russia has, of course, been very active in the Middle East for a, for a long period, and then it, uh, it, uh, it had to leave, and now it wants to come back, and we can see in many different ways that Russia tries to play a major role in, in, in the world again, and after the fall of the Berlin Wall and, 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 and the end of the Soviet Union, the rule of law industry in the Western world, both in the USA as well as in the, in the European Union, has been such that we've been sending experts to the Soviet Union, to Russia, the former Soviet, all the time, for many, many, many years. And they've been on the receiving end. And uh, perhaps it's, it's, it's a bit of an irony, but uh, I, I, I've understood that this draft had been there already for a year. Uh, before it was actually uh, launched in Astana, that they waited for a moment to 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 let it land, and that the 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 reason why they did it there was obviously to take political initiative and have <coughs> a Russian-led, um, let's say, uh, arena next to the Geneva and and, and where the where the role of the UN was very strong, so to mark their place in this in this uh, in political constellation, uh, in a fairly proactive way. I found the, uh, the assessment of the Russian draft, um, uh, calling it uniquely Eurasian, uh, actually uh, overstated. I didn't see many parts, uh, many elements in that uh, draft, which I have not seen in most constitutions of developing countries, uh, Asian, African, Middle Eastern countries over the years. So I, I, I didn't see it as very special. And even the, the number of years, uh, seven years, Israel has a president who was uh, elected for seven years, Italy for seven years, I understand, Ireland for seven years, there are many uh, countries that elect for six years, Finland, um, Venezuela, Russia, Singapore, Lebanon. So uh, I found the, the, the whole assessment uh, slightly exaggerated. It's not a very unusual draft in many ways, I would say. And of course, uh, they want to foster their political goals. And it, it's, it's quite obvious. And, um, <coughs> as much as the EU and the, and the, uh, and, 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 and the US try to do it. Um, uh, yes, Sanguri had <laughs> should have been mentioned. Uh, actually, uh, in Libya's legal system, both uh, civil law and criminal law, has been based on the Egyptian <laughs> system. <laughs> and Sanguri was there for, uh, for, for in, the, in the early 50s mm -hmm. for a few months to help this uh, setting up the system. Um, yes, and in Libya, as you said, I think it would be politically unconceivable to have a constitution where the Islam would not only be the state religion, but also something like the dominant source of legislation. Politically, almost all factions, as far as I know, agree that there should be a, a pretty strong role of the Islam, and that would perhaps be uh, a, a problem for the so-called international community. Mm -hmm. uh, they will respond to that. They will immediately respond to that. It's a, it's, 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 it's crucial for them. Whereas for the for the Libyans, it's kind of self-evident for most Libyans. And the problem is security, and stability, and unity. And of course, now the EU is concerned with migration and terrorism. And so, therefore, these these dialogues are are pretty difficult. The priorities of the Libyan government are not so much seen by the international community and vice versa. I fully agree with your uh, uh, view that the actual question would then be what type of Sharia, what interpretation of Sharia would be compatible with which interpretation of a rule of law? I, I think that's a crucial question and framing it in, in any other way uh, seems to simplify things and also lead to a lot of misunderstandings. Is there, I do we see the failure of the post-colonial state? Um, I don't know whether you, you mean this question very general, but I mean, th there, there, there are more countries in the world than the countries in the Middle East. And th there's lots of things happening in Southeast Asia, for example, and that could not immediately be, f be, be, be seen as the failure of the post-colonial state. I States are in a difficult uh, phase, not only uh, outside Europe. 
our, our state, uh, the Netherlands, uh, is facing difficulties that we could never uh, imagine 10, 15 years ago in terms of ethnic divisions and uh, distrust, complete distrust of, of the political system and therefore the rise of populist parties. Mm -hmm. it is, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and perhaps uh, to end with, I also fully endorse what you said about South Africa, that, that I mean, the constitutional design can be beautiful, but it must be supported by, and then you said, a country's culture. And here, I mean, culture is, I think, it's a very broad concept. Mm -hmm. If it includes a country's social, political, economic uh, constellation, yeah, I fully agree. Um, I, I'm a bit hesitant to see culture as a, as a static concept or something very mm -hmm. specific. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's often used to hide, actually, political and economic factors and actors at, 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 at play. But I think we, in Libya for sure we can see that the constitutional designs are not the problem. The, uh, the, the, the reality is on the ground with militias and other real problems. But if you wanted to uh, intervene. I just thought about the, uh, the areas that has been uh, not uh, under the control of the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. I know there are, there are of course many projects on the ground taking place and uh, there is one which is uh, training the judges of Syria. It's uh, both a dangerous project of course if the land is recaptured by the Syrian government these judges uh, face a, a, a brutal <coughs> fate I guess. But at the same time I think it's a very bold initiative which also one should remember I think that Syria has more judges per capita than many others, especially if you compare to a Western European country. So there is a number of persons to train who will then try to practice law uh, from that type of constitution that we, or, or law that we see as secular. Mm. Um, I will open for a new round. As I carry the microphone, I will say a very Sanburian thing. But the Syrian um, constitution is actually the most Sanhurian because it never referred to a Sharia Islamiyah, but it referred to fiqh, which yeah. was the way that Sanhurian referred to fiqh. When he referred to Sharia, it was only because the Egyptian civil code referred to it in its article uh, on the subsidiary sources of law. So interestingly enough, Syria, which is one of the countries that was least affected by Sanhuri, I had in its constitution a term that he would have used. Uh, yeah. Can I just say something? Yes. Uh, Sanhuri, of course, wrote those constitutions uh, everywhere, you know, Iraq, uh, <laughs> Syria, and so on. Um, and uh, the impression I give, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that the commitment to Sharia is, is uh, purely a gesture. Yeah. But in actual fact, the only bit of the Sharia in the actual legal system are the usual to do with family and personal sure. status sure. law. Yeah. And yeah. everything else is, is, yeah. uh, is secular. I'm, so actually to respond to part of your other yes. question, then I don't want to take this um, yes. uh, room from the speakers, but uh, I was just in Tunisia at the Arab Association of Constitutional Law. Um, and uh, there the issue was precisely raised um, uh, in those terms. Um, Please. Uh, Qasir, Burbank College. Uh, I'm not talking as an academic, I'll talk as a Syrian. Uh, I find it a bit difficult to accept that the Syrian constitution written in Moscow. Constitution for me is, a, is more symbolic than uh, practical. So, like, uh, the, one of the new changes in the new constitution, uh, the one that was drafted in Russia, is that Syria is not an Arab. Uh, republic. It's yeah. just a republic, Syrian republic. So it's more symbolic. It's not like a legal term here. So, like, I don't know about other cases, but constitution, uh, constitutions usually are written by citizens of the country itself. And Russia is 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 deeply involved in the conflict now. It's one of the parties that fighting in Syria. So. Drafting a constitution is imposing a constitution. It's not just drafting. It's not neutral party. So for, for Syrians who are going to discuss it, it's just Im imposed on them. Uh, also, listening to the first speaker, like I think it, the, the one would understand that the problem in Syria is that the, the Syrian regime is too Islamic, and now we need to limit 
the Islamic power, like Islamic, uh, uh, like aspect of uh, the constitution. It's not the case. The case I think there is the many shared elements with the Libyan uh, case, uh, where uh, the the main problem is that those who have uh, the upper hand are the militias, and it's not a legal or constitutional problem. So it's more political and about the powers who are given to the parties there within Syria. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Abdul Lopani. Uh, I'm alumni. I just want to uh, see from the both speakers uh, whether anything can be learned uh, in case of Syria or Libya where like Lebanon multi-confessional and how they have arrived at rapprochement uh, with years of fighting and now you find a sort of peaceful coexistence, whether it is possible to learn something from it. Uh, thanks. <coughs> Ziad is from City University. I'm also a Libyan citizen. Um, I think what happened in 2011, it was not a popular, popular revolution. It was a rebellious led by two parties, or two kind of people. The Islamist group in Libya, um, who were, were, were released a year before what happened in 2011, and the second party who played a big part in it are the Libyan dissidents in the United States and in Europe. And why it happened on the 17th of February? Because in 2006, there was a, um, a demonstration outside the Italian embassy or consulate in, in, in Benghazi, and some of them were shot by the security forces, Libyan security forces. So the Libyan dissident took that particular date and they used to um, uh, um, commemorate that, year, that date every year until 2011. Um, as a consequence of what happened in Libya, there are approximately, as is stated on social media, not less than one million people are being displaced either in Libya or in Tunisia and in and in Egypt. Um, oh, my, my question is, those who write the constitutions where in Russia or Libyans who have double nationalities, is it acceptable and do you think the people, the indigenous people of that, those two countries will accept the constitution at the end if it is, uh, being, if it is implemented later on? To, to end with the, with the last uh, question, um, whether the, uh, the rebellion of 2011 was, I used the word homegrown, and you say, well, there were Islamist groups, and then there were the dissidents in US and Europe, <coughs> so it was not that much homegrown. I can only speak of, of people of Benghazi University who I, who I, who I spoke with uh, many times and very often. <coughs> and the descriptions of what happened in, in the streets of Benghazi uh, suggest to me that there were many students, um, many ordinary people, and later in Tripoli the people I met, journalists, students, um, uh, intellectuals, artists, who just were wearing these militia uniforms because they felt that they had to participate. So I, I, I would think that, that, that it's uh, an important part of, of the revolution is, is, is Libyan in, uh, <coughs> by, by its very nature. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. There are many, many people displaced, uh, many of them in Tunis, many in Egypt, many internally displaced. One of the most tragic groups, of course, the Tawarga, who were uh, in a terrible fight with Misrata, and their whole town was uh, destroyed. Fortunately, there is an agreement between Misrata and Tawarga now. One of the 
small successes that are not mentioned, I think, in the international media. But I think from a Libyan perspective, it is that's, that's quite something has not yet been implemented, but it's there. Uh, is a constitutional which is drafted by outsiders acceptable? No, not at all. I mean, in that respect, I would say the fact that you know, the Russians, they, they actually presented as a draft made by Russian political experts and Middle East experts. I find it a bit silly because in all international collaboration, uh, to, for rule of law reform, including training of judges in, in, in Syria, it's so obvious that if it's a draft just landing, it will never be accepted anywhere, not only for a constitution, but uh, in many other uh, sensitive areas of law. There are countries which are so <coughs> independent, such as Afghanistan, that we've seen lots of drafts are being passed, more or less imposed, most of them being drafted by consultants, they are not absorbed by the legal system at all. The, a, 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 and, then, <laughs> and then the international community talks about a failure, yes. So it would be absolutely right. It, it, it will not work, it's not legitimate, it's not, it's not accepted. Learning from Lebanon, um, I think that's a question for, for life. Uh, the situation in Libya is not one of multi-confessionalist it's 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 all Sunni Muslim basically, uh, so the reconciliation has to take place, but of, uh, along other lines. Um, um, yeah, I think this is what I wanted to say. Yeah, um, the um, first question. Uh, I uh, I don't think I said that Syria is too Islamic. Yeah. I referred ethnographically to interviews I'm doing with religious leaders and presented their perspective and what they think and then I made some comments about what I think they represent. That I think is important uh, in that case. But at the same time I think it's a, uh, this question gives me the opportunity to say that religion has been a very hot topic in Syria long before March 2011. The arrest of the Sunni religious leaders in 2008, 2009, 2010 the uh, Alevi, uh, Alevi tradition and how that has been Shia, uh, Shia Fai, if I may say so, for long, uh, especially since the uh, Bashar al-Assad took power, and how that has been met by protest by Alevi religious uh, leaders. So that, and then you have the Shia and the, 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 the people who came from uh, the conflicts in, uh, in Iraq and ended up in the southern suburbans of, of uh, of Damascus and in other places in Syria and what that implicated and what that, that meant to Syrian society and the dialogue between Sunnis and Shias in the country and the protest from, from, from Sunni leaders. So, so I think the, and uh, or not to mention the terrorist attacks in the heart of Damascus in also 2007, 2008. Uh, so there are, there are a lot to be said about the role of religion in Syria, but I'm, I don't think that Syria is too Islamic and I don't think I, I, I said that. I do think that the idea of the Arab Republic and cutting out the word Arab is very interesting because it goes hand in hand with what I said about how the Syrian uh, state has been trying to negotiate with uh, minorities. And if you, take, if you take the word Arab away, then again you leave room for people to be citizens but being Kurdish or have any other uh, 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 ethnicity or uh, religiosity uh, again which was, I mean, the case in, uh, before this uh, introduction of an Arab Republic in the early 1960s. So I think that's, uh, that goes hand in hand with the, with the Constitution and the writing of the Constitution itself. Um, we have reached the time. Just to uh, briefly say a word for why the two uh, uh, experiences were put one next to each other. Uh, of course, it wasn't to suggest that there were similarities in the specific cases, but rather to focus on the process rather than the specificity of the case. And so that's also the reason why Russian features so prominently in the title, which is, are we to approach the issue of authorship in a very formalistic way? So the authorship of the, con of the text becomes predominant, or is it rather the political agreement, the arrangement that is under it, that is more, uh, you know, momentous. So I think that uh, Jan-Michel 
explain how there was a full Libyan authorship of the, by the CDA, which was actually called the Drafting Committee. It wasn't constitution making, it was constitution drafting, and that operated in isolation, even in Oman. Um, but then the political agreement, you mentioned that, was brokered by international actors. So can, is, it, is it meaningful to differentiate, being formalistic about the authorship of the document and the actual content of the political arrangement that underpins it? Because without the political agreement, you would not have a final text of the Libyan case. So in that sense, it's not about just Libya and Syria, but about the process of constitution making and how the underlying agreement on the governance structure uh, somehow trumps the authorship of the, or the drafting of the actual document. So I think that the two cases so nicely pointed to that uh, articulation of the, of the two uh, dimensions. Uh, so this uh, allows me to uh, mention that the next um, workshop will be end of May, 26th of May. Um, we will have um, a Libyan um, scholar from, from Benghazi, Suleiman Ibrahim, and uh, um, a Hungarian-born uh, um, American uh, scholar from New York, and they will look at Libya governance in the making or in the drafting, so probably some of these issues will be actually um, elaborated further, uh, and it's, again, it's on the postcard that you have on the seats, uh, 2 to uh, 3 p.m., it's a bit earlier because it's the, also the start of uh, Ramadan. <coughs> so thank you all for being with us tonight. Please join me in thanking the two speakers.